Siao cha tum shaba siao cha cha. 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 Amanda. Amanda. Welcome to another podcast of Andy Limatama Speaks. Well, today we're going to deal with the <laughs> problems of ideological misguidedness, problems of lack of ideological clarity, which in this country is going to lead to a situation where there's justification for bringing back white power. We've seen uh, in the last few days in Egrulene, where the uh, racist land thieves representative political party, the Democratic Alliance, was brought back into power with the support of the Marxist Leninist Fanonian revolutionary EFF. So what, the, what explains this, this ability for a left-wing revolutionary movement to give power to a right-wing reactionary power of land thieves? We have entered in South Africa into what I like to call a vulgar pragmatism, where it is about power not about an agenda. And this vulgar pragmatism actually represents the triumph, the victory of a right-wing white political project. We know that during the Cold War, it was a clear ideological battle. And let me just backtrack and emphasize the importance of ideology. Without ideology, you have no understanding who you're fighting, what you're fighting for, and how you must fight. It's a little bit like if we decide to go from Cape Town to Harare, and we have no ideology, we will end up in Messina and somebody will say we have arrived, and that will be the destination. Ideology is critical in pursuing a revolutionary agenda to the end. But there are other building blocks, this ideology, which helps you to understand the totality of who is the oppressor. And then there is also principle. In other words, where we, what is the end goal of the struggle? And then there are tactics in between. Strategies and tactics. A strategy and tactic will be a little bit like if we decide to go to Harare and we come to the river Limpopo, we must make means to get around that problem, right? So if we do not have a clear ideological understanding of what is the end point, when we arrive at the river, somebody will simply say, maybe let's turn here, and then we make a different detour. We never reach our destination because we are not clear about where we are going. The tactic we take must put us in advantage to continue the struggle. So if we meet an obstacle, we must be able to move or negotiate it, zigzag a bit to go where we're going. So it cannot be that under any circumstances, we go into alliance with the oppressor if our end goal is to defeat the oppressor. So we must also clarify who is the oppressor. If we don't know that, we'll fight the ANC, maybe fight another person here, think corruption is the problem, be kept busy, because we don't know who the enemy is. We have to remind ourselves, in the South African situation, the enemy is white monopoly capital, which represents the land thieves, 
politically represented by the Democratic Alliance. And, of course, it, like all oppressors, has its own middle men that protects it. Under apartheid, we know that the apartheid project had the homeland leaders who were the defense team of the apartheid project. Now, we fought against apartheid. We were clear that we must defeat apartheid for us to get liberation. We did not enter, <laughs> because if you think about what is happening with the EFF and the Democratic Alliance, if you agree with my analysis that the Democratic Alliance represents politically the ruling class or the oppressor class or the land thieving class, which under the apartheid situation would be equivalent of the National Party, right? The ANC becomes the bodyguard which can be equated to the homeland system, which was oppressive, which was uh, in defense of the white system, but it was not the main enemy. So if we look at what the EFF is doing now, by going into political alliance or giving political power to the democratic alliance, it is a little bit like under apartheid, the liberation movement giving the national party political power to discipline the homeland leaders. I mean, it's, it, it's exactly like that, that it doesn't make sense that you would give power to the real oppressor in your fight with the secondary problem. How else do we define you than a sellout? How does it help the strategic objective of advancing the struggle against the enemy when you give political power to the enemy? This is what those who are defending this giving of political power to the DA must explain. If we agree the DA is a representative of land thieves, if we agree that DA is the representative of the ruling class, which is Stellenbosch-based, therefore our struggle is against fundamentally the democratic alliance and what it represents. And therefore, when we give it any political power, we become sellouts. We must explain how giving the DA power helps to advance the struggle of black people. Granted, the ANC is a sellout party. The ANC has disappointed black people. The ANC is the bodyguard of white interests. But when you fight the enemy, you do not go into alliance with the real enemy against the bodyguards, which is exactly what is happening right now. Which therefore means in South Africa, there is no more ideological difference between the DA and the EFF. What we have, in a sense, is pragmatism, is a sheer uh, struggle for political power without a clear ideological project about what this power represents and what this power must do. Uh, if I were to just make a, a little bit of a detail and talk about during the Cold War, it was very clear Russia represented the communist agenda, the communist ideological project, the US and Europe represented the capitalist project. And there's this uh, professor from Harvard, uh, Carrington, who argued after 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall, which was the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union as a clear communist uh, country federation. He argued that it was the end of history because it was the end of ideology. 
Of course, that end of ideology did mean the triumph of the capitalist project. And then we saw the globalization project, which was driven by Margaret Thatcher, uh, the Bushes, and so on, which made sure that capitalism became a globalized reality. So in South Africa, we can therefore argue that we are almost ideologically in the same situation where the radical left wing black nationalist project is being defeated by the white ideological construct. Therefore, there's no longer a difference between those who claim to fight for liberation from the point of view of black perspective and the representative of whiteness. Whiteness has been normalized. That is why it is possible to vote for the Democratic Party. Um, the, the, the Democratic Alliance, we will see this normalization will become more and more accepted in the black community. And I argue that part of this acceptance process is this giving of the political power to the DA by EFF. EFF is normalizing this project of white power as a possibility for black people to associate with. Now that means it's an ideological defeat of the left. Because if we need to move forward, we need to sharpen all the time the ideological differences between the oppressed and the oppressor. Once we fudge that ideological difference, the oppressed will no longer know who they're fighting against and what they're fighting for. So we are in a situation in South Africa today where I argue that we're in this hegemony of this vulgar pragmatism, which has um, replaced ideological clarity, where if we're ideologically clear, we would know who the enemy is, we would know what, how to pursue the struggle in terms of our tactics. Our tactics would not weaken the black position and strengthen the enemy. Our tactics all the time would have been maneuvers to make sure that we maximize the possibility of defeating the enemy. But you see, the whole right-wing shift, this vulgar pragmatism, has left to a situation where there is no clear articulation about what the en who the enemy is, who must be fought and defeated. I mean, we see, for instance, how it is easy to sway our people towards fighting against immigrants. You know, the problem is the immigrant who's taking my job, reducing, therefore, the objective of struggle to a subservient position of being a worker, working for the white system, and no understanding of the need to destroy the white system for real liberation to happen. It shows the ideological backsliding of our people. Steve Bigo was very clear and very sharp in maintaining a clarity of who the enemy is and who the people are. And that is why he brought in his black consciousness this Hegelian mechanism of the thesis versus the antithesis, which will give us the same thesis, which is a new order. The thesis is black solidarity, black unity, black organization which is opposed or in, involved in a dialectical struggle with the antithesis, which is white power, which is white racism. And we must maintain these two categories separate and they are fundamentally at war. And only after the war situation, after the conflict between these two forces, can we talk about a new liberatory society where, as Biko says, 
the issue of color shall no longer matter. But before that, the line of who the enemy is, is maintained, and this is critically important. However, the current politics, as I call them, this vulgar pragmatism, has reduced or removed from our politics the ideology. So it does not make any difference if the ANC or EFF or the DA, they all operate in the same ideological framework for the same end result, which are anti-black. You can't tell me that you can give political power to white racist organization and not be in support of the oppression of black people. How do, how do you explain this? Those who support these so-called tactical maneuvers must explain to society how is it in the interest of black people to give political power to the oppressor. We know in the negotiations, for instance, between EFF and the DA uh, and the ANC, the EFF makes very clear demands. But it gives the DA political power with no demands whatsoever. They give the DA political, even when the DA says it rejects them. The DA says we don't want you. They say, oh, boss, please, we are going to give you power because we are fighting the ANC. I mean, this is exactly like if you were in a conflict with your family member. You are fighting here and there's a bigger enemy that will destroy both of you, that has oppressed both of you. When you fight with your family member, you decide to go into an alliance with the oppressor, which of course is waiting to maximize this power to destroy both you and your brother you are fighting. So you're giving a weapon, political power, to the enemy, which is there to destroy all of us black people because the DA's project doesn't care whether you are ANC, you are EFF, you are Black first, land first. So long as you are black, you come under attack. You will be oppressed. So we are in a very dangerous situation in this country where the hegemony of the right wing project. That is why, as I say, it is so easy to mobilize black against black. The um, hegemony of whiteness has created a situation where Whiteness is removed from view, and we are only engaging in this battle amongst ourselves in a way that reproduces, reproduces the white establishment and white power construct, which make going to make sure that whatever black people do, it will make no difference because ideologically we are not clear about where we are going. And the white system clearly says this. And that is why the DA is so arrogant. By simply saying, we will not talk to the EFF. But they know the EFF will give them their votes. They will do the same thing in uh, Johannesburg. Again, in the event that a motion comes for the removal of the DA in, in that city. But what this ideological move shows this ideological construct is the normalization of whiteness in our political system, which means that in 2024, it will be very easy and acceptable for black people to simply give political power to white projects, which are inherently anti-black. So we are shooting ourselves in the foot and calling it um, what, what they call that they, they have superior logic. This is the most illogical, self-destructive moves which are being engineered by agents of white power. So what we can conclude is that the political parties in this country, the main, poli main political parties, are all agents of the white project. Their differences are not fundamental. Because in the, at the end of the day, whatever moves they make 
end up saving the white project, end up legitimizing the white project. You know, it means the big work done by black consciousness of Steve Bigo to try to sort out the minds of black people to understand what the enemy is, who the enemy is, and the need for black people to unite. All that work is being reversed, is being erased. We are almost pre-black consciousness in this country. We are, we are in the situation where our people were still just oxen, as Steve Bigo said. Uh, we are not fighting to reclaim the country to its rightful owners. We are put in a situation where we have reduced our desires for liberation to simply getting a job, maybe an RTP house, maybe a, a little bit of land to put up a shack, but not to, to disarticulate the structures of South African society to make sure that black people become real citizens and they become beneficiaries. Without ideological clarity, there is no revolutionary program. In fact, we know that Lenin said that, that without a revolutionary ideology, there is no possibility of revolutionary move, movement forward. We also know that Cabral teaches us the same, that ideology is critical in pursuing the struggle. And in South Africa, we have already established from struggle an understanding of what ideology means, what is the how the ideology, ideology helps you to frame what the problem is and how you must struggle. I mean, in South Africa, we also, also through struggle, have defined the principle of anti-collaboration, non-collaboration. That principle was created out of the 40s, the ANC, when it was beginning to be part of the National Party with the Ibunga councils, and so on. We know that the New Unity Movement fought ideological battles with the ANC to a point where it was clear that non-collaboration, non-collaboration with the enemy is a critical principle of struggle. That is why it was so easy in the 70s for Steve Bigo and his uh, consciousness movement to reject the homeland system out of hand because they were informed by all those uh, years of struggle pr prior to the formation of the Black Consciousness Movement. We have established principle of non-collaboration in this country, including how it affected even the sports uh, boycotts, the cultural boycotts. It was all non-collaboration. You do not collaborate with the enemy. If you hope to pursue a struggle to the end, but of course, without a clear ideological perspective, you don't even know who the enemy is. Our people believe that the enemy is Zuma and the Guptas. I mean, that is how easy the white machinery, the white ideological construct is able to take our people away, their, our view away from itself, and we end up fighting peripheral battles which simply strengthen the white project. <coughs> we must insist on the clarity of thought and clarity of ideological stance. There is no way you can give the Democratic Alliance political party a still claim to be revolutionary. You must explain how giving political power to the Democratic Party advances the struggle of our people. It cannot be that you are simply disciplining the ANC. The sellout ANC, the bodyguard ANC, you can't fight the ANC in a manner that gives power to the enemy. I mean, really, it's like literally giving ammunition to the enemy because you have a non-antagonistic difference with the sellout ANC. We must maintain that rubric given by Mao Zedong of the levels of contradictions. There is the fundamental contradictions which are between the oppressor and the oppressed, and those contradictions 
are antagonistic and cannot be resolved outside of a revolutionary battle to defeat the enemy. Then you have the non-antagonistic contradictions, which are contradictions between and amongst the oppressed. We, yes, we have our differences, and we need to resolve them differently by dialogue, by education, by engagement. We don't resolve our differences by arming the enemy, by giving power to the enemy to destroy all of us. Because clearly in 2024, if we move in this manner, it would be normal for the EFF in Parliament to stand and move that John Hastaisen of the DA becomes the president of this country. And, and they will vote in that parliament for a DA president. In the, under the pretext of disciplining the ANC. But that will be wholesale giving power to the oppressor. And they are experimenting with this process. We must reject it. And we must be very sharp and clear about just what a sell out position that is. We must find a better way to engage the ANC. We must deal with the ANC in a manner that does not undermine the black project. Because the ANC is just the stumbling block. It's just the, as we say, the um, bodyguard. And how you fight the bodyguard you can't go into alliance with the master of the bodyguard against the bodyguard and claim to be still fighting the master. You have now become part of the problem, part of the master project by entering into that kind of an alliance with the master. It is, you, you shall have lost the objective of your struggle. We do not fight sellouts in alliance with their masters. Sellouts must be dealt with, must be disciplined, and, and they can generally be neutralized without strengthening the hand of the oppressor. But without ideological clarity, we are not going to be able to make that breakthrough. We must go back to the basics of our struggle and answer, ask the very simple question, what is the struggle for? What is the struggle against and how do we get there? So those are questions that will guide us to make sure that we don't make the mistake, which right now it is part of the political practice of South Africa, where ideology has gone out of the window. There is no longer any ideological project on the table. What you have is vulgar pragmatism, as I call it. Um, as Gaten McKenzie would say, he will go into collision even with the AWB. So that is the kind of vulgar pragmatism that we have in this country, where political power can be given to anyone who will give you some kind of advantage. But because the whole political process operates under a framework which is right-wing anti-black pro-capital, Therefore, these um, permutations, if you like, means nothing as far as dealing with the structure of the politics of the country are concerned. So we're going to continue to see these um, fake, if you like, superficial differences which are going to be generated amongst black people. The only constant here is white power. White power controls whatever happens. These little ructions that are happening amongst black people, amongst black political parties, the main constant is white power, which is maintained and sustained to, re to reproduce the racist, anti-black South African society we live in. We will not make progress. We will not defeat the enemy without ideological clarity and being able to suss out who are the revolutionaries and who are the reactionaries. Because otherwise we're going to follow reactionaries and their reactionary projects. 
which they call revolutionary. And we end up in this same situation. We find ourselves with a crisis of vision. Black people in this country are right now under a serious crisis of a vision. We do not know what we're fighting for, who we're fighting against, who the enemy is. And that is why it is so easy to sway black people this way and, or, or, or the other way without confronting the real enemy. The real enemy is invisible. It is out of vision and it is manipulating the situation. Just like we see that, that guy, Rob Herzog of uh, Stellenbosch, how he is able to mobilize our anti-immigrant sentiments to create even movements against the immigrant, which of course we know it is black on black violence generated by white capital's exploitation of both the external labor and South African labor, putting these labors, if you like, into competition and degenerating or uh, pressing uh, down the labor market where wages are becoming lower and lower and profits higher and higher. But without a clear ideological orientation, we will not even see that. What we will see is this superficial idea that the problem is corruption, the problem is Zuma, the problem is the Guptas. And we end up organizing on this basis and never be able to make a breakthrough in terms of the real fundamental problems of this country, which remains white monopoly capital, which remains the holding of the economy and land, which remains the cultural dominance of whiteness in knowledge production and so on. Without ideology, <laughs> there is no progress. Without the ideology, there is no sense of what is being fought for. And we can therefore say that today in South Africa, we have reached a point of the end of ideology. And the only and the end of ideology does not mean there's no ideology. It simply means the triumph, the victory of the right-wing ideological project, which is the one that dictates how politics are organized, how activism even happens, how far our demands are articulated. Um, we're all operating within this right-wing anti-black space and, and therefore our efforts are simply there to reproduce the same oppressive white system. We need to go back to black consciousness which help us articulate again in a very basic way what is the fundamental problem in South Africa. If you don't know that you will be lost and you will be uh, swindled and be used in all manner of ways which are against your fundamental interests. But black consciousness help us to clarify again what we're fighting for, what we're fighting against, who the enemy is, who our friends are. And then in this way we're able to articulate a political practices we strengthen the black agenda. We strengthen our possibility to defeat the enemy. Without black consciousness, as we see right now, there's this hegemony of this vulgar pragmatism I talk about, and which is basically organizing politics with whomever you can enter into for whatever project. And mostly those projects in South Africa are anti-black. Mostly this vulgar pragmatism is to reduce the desire of black people for liberation, to simply become at best workers, providing some work, some kind of um, development, small development in uh, local communities without dealing with the real problem of land, the real problem of economic ownership, 
the racism which persists in this country, including simply in how the management uh, structures reflect white domination, despite the fact that white people are only 9% of the population. We are not going to make progress without ideological clarity. So this is a call to return back to ideology. And the ideology that has uh, organically developed in this country to help us understand what the problem is, what we're fighting for, and how we fight is black consciousness. So this is a call for us to return to back to black consciousness. And just in conclusion, as the movement I represent, Black First Land First, we have developed a code against sellouts. You can Google it. A BLF code against sellouts. In it, there's about 10 points we articulate, which help us in, in this way. In a sense, we are trying to operationalize the idea of who the enemy is, how you fight without setting out, how you deal with sellouts in a manner that does not strengthen the hand of the enemy. And we call out very clearly in that document the, the enemy and the mechanisms that we undertake to deal with those who are sellouts in a manner that does not strengthen the hand of the oppressor. We need to have a guide in struggle in order to be able to make progress. Otherwise, we are going to be kept busy by sellouts who are funded by white capital, who have turned the struggle into a business which gives them so much money and they can live in this amazing life whilst talking about the liberation of black people when you look in terms of their practice, they are simply reproducing white power. We are in real danger in this country today of the hegemony of white power again becoming normalized and a party such as the Democratic Alliance being presented as a real option for our people because we are legitimately so angry against the ANC. Our anger against the ANC is justified the ANC has not served the black people. But we cannot, when we fight the ANC, give white power, uh, power back to it. We cannot revert back to the apartheid system. We have to progress further in terms of empowering black people. And that is, can be achieved only by how we use political power in a sustained, systematic way that puts black people's interest first we cannot collaborate with the enemy and still claim to be fighting for black people is with it siao tatu mshaba siao tata 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 Amanda! Amanda!